Have you ever uh, heard of an empty chair debate? Is that something that's popular here in this country? The uh, empty chair debate is a, is a debate where the person uh, is unable to be here uh, for various reasons. Um, the person might have refused to show up. Uh, the person was just um, out of the country. Whatever the reasons are, you have an empty chair, and then what happens is the debate proceeds regardless, and you debate the empty chair. So the person who you want to debate is not able to be here physically present. So an empty chair is left to where they would be and where they would sit. And to, draw, to actually draw the attention to the fact that they're not here. But I want you to do something a little bit different tonight, friends. I want you to imagine that at that empty chair would have been occupied by the Lord Jesus Christ. And instead of a back and forth debate, he, the Lord Jesus Christ, will be questioned by some of the leading journalists in the world as they try to figure out who he is and question him about his beliefs and his teachings. Now to be clear, friends, our belief is the Lord Jesus Christ is in heaven at present. As we're told that in Acts chapter 1, verses 10 and 11. So he could not physically attend the question session. But what we hope to look at tonight is the words that the Lord Jesus Christ spoke while he was on earth as recorded in the Bible. These words we hope to show tonight will serve as his answers to the questions that are going to be brought forward. Now, if you've been following what people have been saying on uh, social media, all the different media platforms, people say that they're trying to say what they want in political leaders. And you see that on all the social media platforms, they're calling out for what they want in terms of leadership. And what we're going to demonstrate tonight, friends, we might be in for a little bit of a shock from the answers that the Lord Jesus Christ is going to give to some of the questions that are posed. Because some of these questions that we're going to see tonight were actually posed to the Lord Jesus Christ 2,000 years ago. And you might even find it alarming that the Jesus that the churches are teaching us and the beliefs that they say Jesus espouses may be very different from the words that he actually does speak. And we hope to demonstrate that a little bit tonight. So before we get to the Q&A session, we need to lay out just a few uh, observations to set the scene. So our premise is that the Lord Jesus Christ is the Son of God. That's the first thing we want to point out as we move through our presentation. And we put a proof verse up there for those that are taking notes of Matthew 26, verses 63 to 64. We believe what Jesus says about himself. And the second premise that's important for us tonight is that the Lord Jesus Christ's words are recorded for us in the Bible. Since we are all Bible students tonight and those listening in and watching tonight, it's a pretty fairly safe basis for us to proceed. And we put a supporting verse of John 21 and verse 25 to back that up. Our third premise is, is that some, not many, are looking for his coming. To some, it will be the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. And Hebrews 9 and verse 28 is a good verse to support that. Some, in fact, do look for the return of Christ. And our fourth premise is that most, and we would say this one is the vast majority of the world, many of those who do look for his coming will not accept Christ, even when he does return. Now that may be a bit of a shocking statement, because a lot of the churches in the world are calling for a Messiah or the return of Christ, and our suggestion to you, friends, tonight is they will not accept Christ when he comes. And the scriptures have some interesting things to say about this particular aspect 
of the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. So if you have your Bibles there, we're going to go to Psalm 2 and at verse 2. So here in Psalm chapter 2, we're reading about a, a prophetic picture when the Lord Jesus Christ will return to the earth to set up his Father's kingdom. And the evidence of that is if you just cast your eyes down to verse 6 of Psalm 2, we read there, Yet have I set my king upon my holy hill of Zion. Now this has never happened in history. This has never happened to God's son. So it has to be prophetic. And there are a few other points like that within this chapter, that, but this one will just suffice for now. So this really then is the context of Psalm 2. It's a future prophecy. You'll also notice that when the Lord Jesus Christ does return, it does not go well. He will be rejected just as he was the first time that he came. The world will not see him as the Son of God, and the policies of his government and the teachings that he promulgates will be the opposite of what the world wants. Take a look at Psalm 2, verses 1 to 3. And I've put this translation, this is the net translation of the Bible. I think it captures it quite nicely here. So we read Psalm 2, verses 1 to 3. Why do the nations rebel? Why are the countries devising plots that will fail? The kings of the earth form a united front. The rulers collaborate against the Lord and his anointed king. They say, let's tear off the shackles they've put on us. Let's free ourselves from their ropes. So when Christ returns, we're told people will view his rule and his teachings as oppressive. And actually, this will get steadily worse in his rule, but they will view it as oppressive. The governments of the world will form an alliance, a united front against God's anointed. They actually view, as we see here with the psalmist writes, they view his teachings as shackles. It's like they're in chains. His teachings are constraining them from doing what they want to do. Their freedom has been reined in so much that they view Christ's rule as almost like it's like ropes. They're restricting their movement. They're restricting their freedom of thought. They can no longer do what they want to do. It's hard to believe that Christ will be rejected. But friends, is it really that hard to believe? You know, take for example, the Jewish people in the first century. They thought Jesus was their, as their Messiah. He would come as a lion to save them from the Roman rule. Well, he didn't come like a lion, did he? He came as a lamb. And although celebrated initially, he was later rejected and crucified. In Revelations chapter 5, verses 5 to 6 we read this, and this is the language of a lion and of a lamb. And you can see that if you get this concept wrong, you can reject the Lord Jesus Christ, as the Jewish people did in the first century. And so we read in Revelation chapter 5, verses 5 and 6, we read this. And one of the elders said unto me, Weep not, behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, hath prevailed to open the book and to loose the seven seals thereof. And I beheld, and lo, in the midst of the throne and of the four beasts, and in the midst of the elders stood a lamb, as it had been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent forth into all the earth. Well, the Jewish people in the first century got all this confused. As Revelation tells us, the Lord Jesus Christ is both a lion and a lamb. in character, and in royal lineage to David's throne. But that is also where the confusion started for some. They got the timing of these qualities of the Lord mixed up. He did not come as a lion to liberate them from the Romans, and he was therefore rejected. Well, how ironic 
that when we read that Jesus returns the second time, the world will look for Jesus as the lamb, meek, mild, our friend Jesus. And they will get it wrong. Because the second time he comes, he comes as a lion. And just like we read in Psalm 2, and there's other scriptures, Jesus actually returns to destroy and put down world governments that will not submit to, them, to him and the wickedness of man. And in a further twist, it is the Jewish people that we are told who will be the ones to actually accept the Messiah. They will look on him, Zechariah tells us. This is Zechariah 12. They will look on him whom they've pierced. And they'll realize, oh, it was the Messiah that our forefathers crucified. And they will accept him the second time. But not so for Christianity. They will see Christ as the anti-Christ according to their church doctrine. And this doctrine is still very much taught. In fact, it's very alive and well in many of the southern parts of the United States of America. Now, this isn't our subject tonight. That's another subject for a whole night. It's very interesting. But I'd just like to quote, make one quote here just to kind of uh, illustrate our point. This is from a book by a fellow by the name of Bill Shesansky, and he wrote a book entitled, Will the Real Antichrist Please Stand Up? And he wrote this. He said, The Antichrist will actually pose as the Messiah, but he will claim messianic titles and privileges. The Antichrist will be a person who will attempt to convince Israel that he is their long-anticipated Messiah. Here then is another shocking reason why Christ will be rejected when he comes a second time. Popular church doctrine as taught by Christian authors, Christian uh, pastors, religious leaders. Uh, there was a, the book Hal Lindsey. He had a, a, a great selling book called The Late Great Planet Earth. And a number of other Christian authors have written to say when Christ comes back, they actually describe what we would say, friends, when we look in the Bible as those things pertaining to Christ, they say all of that is actually the Antichrist. And if you were to line up everything related to Christ's return as recorded in the, by the Bible, beside popular church doctrine about the Antichrist, you'll see the two are almost identical. No wonder when Christ returns, the nations and the peoples will want to cast off the ropes that his restrictive teachings will impose on them. And I would advance for your consideration, friends, that not only does the world now not accept or follow Christ's teaching, but morally, they have moved so far away from Christ's teachings that they will reject and resent him purely on a moral basis as well. Well, let's, let's begin then to uh, look at our open air or open chair debate with our Q&A session. So what we've done is we've got a very prestigious group of journalists here from around the world, and they hold the same skepticism and they reflect the feelings of their countrymen as they question the Lord Jesus Christ and what he is teaching. And to us, the listeners, I would ask that each of us, perhaps we might want to write down our own questions. What questions do you think the world's journalists will ask the Lord Jesus Christ when he comes? Then I want you to think about what answers do you think the Lord Jesus Christ would give them? All right, so let's go. Let's begin. Again, we would ask all our reporters who are in the hall tonight, if they would uh, direct their questions to the chair. And, uh, and then we'll, uh, we'll go from there. So the first thing we're going to do, we're going to have a reporter that's going to represent Canada, where we come from, and that's going to be uh, Edith Grafton. So Edith Grafton, you got the first question. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. 
Since you claim to be the leader of the world and that all of our governments should submit to you and your representatives, who are called saints, our country would like to know, what credentials do you have and are you claiming to be the actual son of God? Typical, very good question from Canada. They always want to know your credentials. You have a very deep voice, by the way, or not a very deep voice, so that's very nice. Sorry we had a, an incorrect picture up, of you up there, Edith Grafton. So can we summarize Edith Grafton's question this way from Canada? Edith Grafton has asked the question, what credentials does the Lord Jesus Christ have? He's saying all these things, what credentials does he have? Do you think the Lord was ever asked that question? We know the Lord was asked that question. He was constantly challenged with that particular question. And to that we would advance this. In Luke 22, verse 70, from Young's Literal, when they asked Jesus that very question, he says, Ye say it, because I am. He declared plainly and clearly what his credentials were. He was the Son of God. We would also advance for your consideration John 14 and verse 10. Believest thou not that I am in the Father and the Father in me? The words that I speak unto you, I speak not of myself, but the Father that dwelleth in me. He doeth the works. Now can you imagine that being said to the world? It was said to the world. How did they respond? And again, we could advance uh, other uh, verses here, but I think that will suffice for now. So again, we, we thank the reporter um, from uh, Canada. So the next reporter that we'd like to go to is uh, going to represent a country that's not very far away from here, and that's the country of uh, New Zealand. And uh, this reporter's name is uh, Roger Terence. And so Roger, you get to ask uh, the next question. Thanks, uh, Chairman. Uh, you have been quoted as saying there is only one way to worship God, your way. In our country, we allow freedom of, for all religions. Are you saying all religions are wrong and the Jews have the only right religion? Okay, it's a very good question. Thank you for that. So if we could summarize your question this way for New Zealand, are you really saying that there is only one religion? That's the question. Well, again, to that question, we would advance this. This is uh, from John 4, and just for context, we'll read from John 4, verses 22 and 23. Jesus says, you worship, he's talking to the Samaritans, and he says to the Samaritans, you worship, you know not what. We know what we worship, for salvation is of the Jews. Now, I want you to think about that, friends. In the context, this is coming from a reporter from New Zealand. This is being heard around the world. And they're hearing the fact that salvation is of the Jews. Verse 23, But the hour cometh, and now is, when the true worshippers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father seeketh such to worship them. We would also say, have you never read? Consider what the apostles said. In Ephesians chapter 4, verses 4 and 5, this is what the apostle Paul wrote. He says, There is one body and one spirit, even as you are called in one hope of your calling. One Lord, one faith, one baptism. And the word one is not very popular today. Because people today think there's many ways to get to God. Your religion is great, my religion is great, your religion's great. We all have great religions. There's many ways to get to God. That's not what the Bible says. Is Jesus saying there's one religion? Well, the apostle Paul says there is. So whatever it is, friends, we've got to find it because it says there's only one. So it's very important that we see that. All right, so for the next question, we're going to go out to a reporter from the United States. This reporter is from Fox News, and it's uh, Mr. Mike Cooper. Mr. Mike Cooper? Yes, this is uh, Mike Cooper from the United States of America. I have a two-part question, if that is okay. As you may know, we have a lot of companies and people who make their living from social media platforms such as Twitter, Meta, and Instagram. 
In addition, we have a massive industry in Hollywood, California, that makes billions of dollars in the movie content and streaming, streaming businesses. My first question is, will your government abolish social media? And my second question is, are you advocating that there will be no more movie industry? All right, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Cooper, for the question. So we could summarize Mr. Cooper's question, if it's fair, we could summarize your questions like this. To the chair, to the Lord Jesus Christ, will you abolish social media? Are you advocating that there will be no more movie industry? Now that's a loaded two-part question. That particular question affects millions of people around the world. And it affects hundreds more millions of people who watch it and enjoy that content. Well, we would advance to that, this particular verse from Ephesians chapter 5 and verses 4 to 6. And we've quoted this also uh, from the net. So we read here, the Apostle Paul says this, Neither should there be vulgar speech, foolish talk, or coarse jesting, all of which are out of character. You can be confident of this one thing, that no person who is immoral, impure, or greedy, such a person is an idolater, has any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. Because of these things, God's wrath comes on the sons of disobedience. And that is opposite to the headline of a major movie. The industry stands for the opposite of what the Apostle Paul says will be the order of the day. It will not be allowed to stand. If we take a look in our Bibles to Colossians chapter 3, verses 4 to 6, we would also say to Mr. Cooper, have you never read? When Christ, we read here in verse 4, who is your life appears, this is Colossians 3, verses 4 to 6, then you too will be revealed in glory with him. So put to death whatever in your nature belongs to the earth. Sexual immorality, 99% of the movie industry, gone. Impurity, shameful passions, evil desire, and greed, which is idolatry. Because of these things, the wrath of God is coming. Romans 12, verse 9. Let love be without dissimulation. Abhor that which is evil. Paul says. 1 Corinthians 15, 33. Be not deceived. Evil communications corrupts good morals or good manners. So it's very clear how the Lord Jesus Christ would answer that question. That industry is in dire shape when Christ returns. How do you think the world is going to react to that? All right, so the next question we're going to go out to is the reporter from TV Spain. And this TV reporter is Mr. Michael Vasquez. So, Mr. Michael, you're, the floor is yours. Muchas gracias, señor. Yo soy señor Vasquez. Y le quiero preguntar, los derechos humanos han avanzado mucho en los últimos 2,000 años en realidad. También en los últimos 50 años hemos visto un gran progreso en los derechos y la igualdad de hombres y mujeres. Thank you. So, oh. perdón, perdón. Tantos derechos a, a, ahora están consagrados en nuestra ley e instituciones gobernales, así como soportado por la Carta de Derechos Humanos de las Naciones Unidas. Usted está diciendo que el matrimonio solo puede ser entre un hombre y mujer. Excellent. Thank you, Mr. Vasquez, and thank you to the translators who were so fast. 
So, Mr. Vasquez asks a very interesting question, and we'd like to summarize it this way. Are you saying same-gender marriage is wrong? How would the scriptures answer that question? Again, friends, we would advance this. Matthew 19, verses 4 to 6, the words of the Lord Jesus Christ. And he answered and said unto them, Have you not read? He which made them at the beginning made them male and female, and said, For this cause shall a man leave father and mother, and shall cleave to his wife, and they twain shall be one flesh. Wherefore, there are no more twain, but one flesh. What therefore God hath joined together, let not man put asunder. So again, with our Bibles open, we can see clearly the advance that the Lord Jesus Christ would put to that question. And that question is not only for Mr. Vasquez, that question is around this world. Take a look at Romans 1, verses 26 to 32. Romans 1, verses 26 to 32. We'll just read a portion of this section for time's sake uh, tonight. And again, this is a really good verse to have in our minds or in the backs of our Bibles when this particular question is advanced. How do you answer this question? And the answer from the scriptures from the Apostle Paul says, For this cause God gave them up unto vile affections, talking about the world, for even their woman did change the natural use into that which is against nature. And likewise also the men, leaving the natural use of the woman, burned in their lust one toward another, men with men working that which is unseemly, and receiving in themselves that recompense of their error which was meet. And the net version says, and likewise the men also abandoned natural relations with women and were inflamed in their passions for one another. Men committed shameful acts with men and received in themselves the due penalty for their error. And friends, we'll let you finish reading verses 28 to 32. And if you have a, a net version or even an ESV version, it's interesting to look at those translations as well. Okay, so the next question, we're going to go out to the most popular, most popular, uh, populist country in the earth. In fact, they just recently overtook China as the greatest population in the world, and that is India. And India has an incredible amount of young people. So we're going to ask Ashu Goal to the reporter for TV uh, India to uh, ask that uh, the next uh, question for us. Ashu? Sorry, Mr. Chair, uh, Mr. Jesus, there was no flights and uh, no technology. We've done something to the technology. Um, and Mr. Modi uh, has asked me to ask this question, especially in Hindi. Okay, uh, very good. Okay. Um, so, in our country, there are a lot of young people and a lot of people are popular and polluted. And our um, question is that our young people are very technology or sab mein aa gaye aur hum koshish karte hain har cheez ki research kar har har cheez ko aage badhne ke liye ab aap keh rahe hain ki hum sare raaston ko badal dein aur hum apne aap ko change kar dein to aisa kaise mumkin hai to aap hame bataye hum kya kare bahut zyada confusion ho gaya hai okay very good thank you for that question so here we have a reporter representing India, and they're putting the question forward. Are you saying our generation of young people have got it wrong? The most awake generation, not woke generation, they call themselves an awake generation. Do they have it wrong? How would you advance that question? We would put this to your consideration. Consider in the Proverbs, these words in Proverbs 30, verse 12. There is a generation that are pure in their own eyes. And that in the net, pure in their own opinion. And yet is not washed from their filthiness. 
It's very powerful to think of that, isn't it? Some very, some very powerful words from Solomon to think about that. We would also advance this. Wherefore, let him that thinketh he standeth take heed lest he fall. So to the woke generation, we would advance this. And to the young people of India that he was asking that question on behalf of it, really is a question that the world young people are asking. And we're saying that there is a generation that are pure in their own eyes. Outside of God's word, anything then can be acceptable. We are acceptable in our own eyes, but we have to turn to that word to see what is acceptable to to God. All right. Now, we want to go to the People's Republic of China. We're going to ask Mr. Yan Li to represent the People's Republic of China. Mr. Li? I can't believe this is what I heard. The Chinese uh, Thank you for the question. And I can understand why you'd be upset. There'd be a lot of people that'd be upset. There are a lot of people who'd be upset in the school systems and universities around the world. Because is the Lord Jesus Christ saying, are you saying evolution will no longer be allowed to be taught at schools and universities? Well, again, to that we would advance, friends. Mark 10, verse 6. The Lord believed in creation. But from the beginning of the creation, God made them male and female. Simple, yet very profound. Mark 13, verse 19. But it, for in those days shall be affliction such as was not from the beginning of the creation which God created unto this time, neither shall be. And you'll see time and time again, the Lord reiterates and, and substantiates that of creation. The Lord believed in creation. The Lord believed in Adam and Eve. The Lord believed in the Garden of Eden. And so there will be a massive change that we can see that the Lord is talking about here that will affect our school systems. So it will affect people around the world. All right, so the next question, we want to go out to the Netherlands, to Mr. Hans Vandenberg, who's going to ask this next question on behalf of the Netherlands and behalf of the European Union. So, Mr. Vandenberg, please. Meneer, zoals u wellicht we hebben er wij een zeer gedankst roemetwaard programma, genaamd de Nederlandse roemetige organisatie, en wij zijn zwaar bezig landen aan de US te helpen, de Maas willen koloniseren, en zelf een woord te doen aan wijzigheid op de maan hebben. Onder uw bedaling zijn er getrochten dat de roemete ook zal worden gekort. Kunt u de bijverstegen om of te ookenen? Want er zijn honderden duizenden mensen werkzaam in de route met technologie over de hele wereld. Zegt u dat de financiering van het route met waarschap zal worden verminderd? Excellent. Very good question. And that question would be a great question also coming from uh, NASA as well. Are you saying that all the space agencies and high tech will not receive any more funding. Think about all the hundreds of thousands, millions of people employed in these industries. And to this we would advance, friends, is the pursuit at the time when the Lord Jesus Christ returns about going to Mars. This is what we read in Psalm 115, verse 16. The heavens, even the heavens are the Lord's, but the earth hath he given to the children of men. Very clear. 
Isaiah 45, verse 18. For thus saith the Lord that created the heavens, God himself that formed the earth and made it. He hath established it. He created it not to be in vain. He formed it to be inhabited. I am the Lord. And there is none else. So friends, we would advance for you this consideration of these words. Even we can think of Matthew 5, verse 5. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. And yet there's billions and billions and billions of dollars being spent to go, to moon, go back to the moon and to go to Mars. And will this be the pursuit when the Lord Jesus Christ comes? Well, we can see from verses like this, it doesn't make sense that it would be. And if it doesn't make sense what it would be, how's the world going to react when the Lord Jesus Christ answers a question that is posed like this? Now, we're going to go back to one more question, um, or we're going to ask two more questions, but another, the United States is very pushy, and they would like to have another question. And uh, this is also coming from that reporter with a bit of a Texas accent. And um, to uh, Mike Pox, or uh, Mike Cooper. Mike Cooper with a very legit accent. We have just been through an election that our intelligence agency says was subjected to hacking by outside governments and false information campaigns. Do I understand correctly that you are advocating for a one world, non-elected government? In other words, are you saying that your government will not be subject to any elections? Okay, I can understand why you'd be upset about that because the U.S. loves democracy and they hold themselves up as, a, as the number one democratic nation in the earth. And so now it seems that there's going to be no more elections. And there's only one person that can be accepted. So if we could summarize that, what do you mean that there will be no more elections? Well, we would advance this first for support of that. Daniel 7, verse 27 from the net. Then the kingdom, authority, and greatness of the kingdoms under the whole heaven will be delivered to the people of the holy ones of the Most High. His kingdom is an eternal kingdom. All authorities will serve him and obey him. Now again, how popular do you think that's going to be? There's going to be one ruler, one person in charge. Now we're going to have uh, one more question and um, we're going to let the uh, last question go to um, Australia, funny enough. So we're going to let the uh, last, um, I have no translation for this one. So we're going we're gonna to let the last uh, one be from Australia. You seem to be advocating the opposite to what our government are proposing. And you seem to be looking at setting our laws back hundreds of years. Our movie industry, our space, exploration, and even our military technology to defend ourselves. We will be done away with under your rule. We can't even elect you or our people called, your people called saints. So my country really wants to know what kind of government or world are you promising under your rule? All right. Very good. Thank you for that question. Fair enough. From Australia, they're saying, all right, you're saying no to a lot of these things. What kind of government are you promising? What kind of a world uh, are you promising us then? To, event, to that, we would say, look at Isaiah 11, verse 9. This is the type of world that the Lord Jesus Christ is going to promise. They shall not hurt nor destroy in all my holy mountain, for the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. You don't even have to get very far in that verse to be absolutely blown away by that verse. They shall not hurt. That's the type of government the Lord Jesus Christ is promising. Galatians 3 verse 28. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither bond nor free. There is neither male nor female. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. And finally we would advance Micah 4 verse 3. And he shall judge among many people and rebuke strong nations afar off. They shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nations shall not lift up a sword against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. And that's exactly the opposite of what's happening 
in our world today. You can just flip those, that verse around because that's exactly what the world is doing. But look at the world that the Lord Jesus Christ is promising. Absolutely remarkable, incredible. And there's many other verses we, would, we could go to, but we'd just like to thank, for the sake of time, we'd like to thank the reporters for the very, from the various world news organizations and our thanks to all of those that were listening. And the one thing, friends, if I could just interject here, I think when the Lord Jesus Christ, I'm not even saying they would get an opportunity to ask questions, but I, I would say this, they wouldn't be as nice as these reporters. Because I suspect that the questions that the world is going to have are going to be far more, more pointed and they're going to be far more disrespectful. And I wonder if the Lord's words that he spoke many years ago to the Jews of his day would be appropriate in a question and answer session like that. And that's found in John 8 and verse 45. Because we live in a world today that is full of disbelief. They do not believe God's word. They don't have the time for it, for one thing. In a world of such disbelief, consider John 8, verse 45. Jesus says, and because I tell you the truth, you believe me not. I told you the truth, you don't believe me. Can you imagine that? Jesus tells the truth, and the world believes him not. What an indictment. And what have we learned, friends, as we've examined the scriptures advanced to answer the questions posed tonight? Well, I believe that we have seen that the world's moral thermometer has fallen so far below biblical standards, a book, by the way, that people read less and less and they're less familiar with, that the world now actually stands in opposition to the teachings and morals of God as exhibited and taught by his son. People today believe more in themselves than they do God. The mantra of today is do your best, live your best life, love yourself. As long as you're happy with yourself, nothing else really matters. By the way, you're your own standard. They say, well, that's not fair. People don't really do that, do they? Yeah, they do that. The world is opposed to Christ and he hasn't even returned yet. We live in an age that says you have to make your own way in life. There's some interesting quotes here. The first quote I'm, I'm putting up here is by a fellow by the name of Richard Bach. Perhaps you've heard of him. He's, a, he's an American writer. He's written a number of books. He even wrote the book, The Adventures of a Reluctant Messiah in 1977. This is what he says. I do not exist to impress the world. I exist to live my life in a way that will make me happy. And we would say Mr. Bach does not just speak for Mr. Bach. Amish Tripathi, he is also a very well-known Indian writer. He's one of their greatest uh, sellers of books. And he says this, there is your truth and there's my truth. And as for the universal truth, it does not exist. I've told you the truth and you don't believe me. And finally, a very well-known TV personality, writer, philanthropist, Oprah Winfrey says this, living your best life is your most important journey in life. Friends, the world believes that this life is your own to do what you want. You make your own choice. As long as you're happy, it's fantastic. Well, what's the Lord Jesus Christ's view of this? How do you think the Lord would respond to this. Can you think of something in your mind how the Lord would respond to this type of philosophy? We would advance this from John 14, verse 6. Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. It's not your truth, it's not your way, and it's not your life. It's mine, and you come to me. So that's the challenge that the Lord Jesus Christ puts to the world. And the problem, as we've seen in our consideration of a world opposed to the Lord Jesus Christ, is people like parts, but they don't like the package. In other words, they like clean air, they don't mind getting rid of pollution, give us clean drinking water, solve world hunger, but don't take my internet away. Don't take my freedoms away. They like the parts but they don't like the package. I don't like all the rules. I don't like all the laws that go with your kingdom. 
Certainly not the ones the Lord Jesus Christ and his saints, his faithful followers, are going to impose on the world. We believe, friends, that that day is coming soon. It's coming soon when the Lord Jesus Christ will return to set up his Father's government on this earth. Never get complacent into thinking that this big world of ours wants the real Christ. The real Christ is not the one they want. What you can control is what you do and how you think. Here's what the Lord Jesus Christ is looking for when he comes back. Does this describe you? Be wise now, therefore, O you kings. Be instructed, ye judges of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the son lest he be angry and ye perish from the way when his wrath is kindled but a little. Blessed are all they that put their trust in him. Do you put your trust in God? Does that describe you, friends? Because this is, going to what is what's going to happen to the governments of this world. And this is the end of that psalm that we looked at in Psalm 2, verses 10 to 12. Because the world will be told, you will serve the Lord. Kiss the Son. Blessed are all they that put their trust in him. What a change is going to happen to this world. And we believe, friends, as we said, that that day is coming very soon. And we'll conclude with this verse in Isaiah 66 and verse 2. Does this describe you and I? For all those things hath my hand made, and all those things have been, saith the Lord. But to this man, to this woman, will I look even to him that is poor and of a contrite spirit and trembleth at my word. Thank you.